Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I've been designated as honorary chair for tonight's meeting and for the six other meetings that relate to the matter before us tonight. Um, and I hereby call the meeting to order at uh, 731. This may be the closest we are to being on schedule all night, so we should save it this moment. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak uh, uh, to please mute themselves uh, until they're recognized by the chair. That will help avoid the familiar disturbances. Um, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, first, members of the of the Board of Appeals, Christian Klein. Present. Roger Dupont. Here. Uh, Daniel Ricardelli. Here. Venkat Holy. I know Venkat is here because I saw him just a moment ago. Elaine Hoffman. Here. Uh, Adam LeBanc. Here. Great. Uh, town officials, uh, Colleen Ralston. Here. Kelly Linema. Marisa Lau. Present. Uh, outside counsel, uh, Paul Haverty of uh, BBH Law. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening. And appearing for the applicant, uh, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor. Here. And Erica Schwartz. Here. And everybody else appearing for the uh, appearing for the applicant can be will be eventually be introduced by uh, one of those two people. Um, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects that was signed into law on March 29th, 2023. Uh, this act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period um, during each public meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda uh, posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast eventually by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others by computer or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum and during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the meeting's website or the town's website unless otherwise noted. Uh, the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. I should note to you that uh, while we do keep we do keep adding things to the agenda, there's always a little bit of a lag and so you may uh, need to check back again to find things that are being uh, uh, put in at the last moment. We've received a number of letters, for example, today. They're not on the website yet, but trust us, we, they will be uh, in due time. So as the board will be taking up new business tonight, uh, I make the following land acknowledgement pursuant to town policy, whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy and Algonquin word meaning swift waters. The board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the 
on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So there are no, the only item on our agenda today is a public hearing for comprehensive uh, permit. Uh, this evening, uh, the board is opening a comprehensive permit hearing. The pro 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 project at 10 Sunnyside Avenue is the redevelopment of an existing site in the vehicular oriented business or B4 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website as noticed before. This is a pretty exciting uh, moment for us because this is a project that is being submitted by a housing corporation of Arlington. It is all affordable, whereas most 40B projects are affordable only in part. Uh, and it includes a substantial number of more deeply discounted uh, affordable units. So it's a, it's a big event to happen in Arlington. And it's at a really interesting location because it is located right on a bus line within within a, a few hundred feet of a place where of Clarendon Station, where a number of bus lines come together. It's near bicycle paths, and and uh, it is a remarkable location uh, in many ways. And it uh, so it's a pleasure to be able to open the proceeding. And to uh, and to delve more deeply as we will over this meeting and several others um, on this application. So I, I want to bore you. I don't really want to bore you, but I will just the same um, with a little bit of an introduction to the comprehensive permit process uh, that will sort of set the framework going forward. Um, the applicants are going to be invited at the outset to introduce themselves and their team. And they'll make a brief presentation, or at least they will say it's a brief presentation, and I will accept them at their word, and uh, of the application of the project that is proposed by the applicants. The board we can then, members of the board, will present questions uh, of the applicant um, before we open the hearing to public comment. Uh, there will be a brief intermission, uh, about five minutes, between the initial presentation by the applicant uh, and the comment from all of you. So what is this comprehensive permit stuff? It's also known as 40B. It was established by the state in 1969 to allow developers devoting a certain percentage of the units in a development uh, as being affordable. And then the developer could get expedited review whereby the Zoning Board of Appeals would hear the application and be authorized to grant waivers for from any local statute or bylaw which it finds can be granted without negatively impacting the health, safety, and welfare of local residents. The applicant cannot request waivers from state laws and regulations, uh, which remain in full effect. And that would include the Wetlands Act, uh, it includes the state building code, and st similar state laws. Once a comprehensive permit is filed, the board has 30 days to open a public hearing, and the town says seven days to notify departments, boards, and commissions of the receipt of the application. Uh, once the hearing begins, which is what is happening tonight, uh, the board has 180 days to hear the case and close the public hearing unless the parties mutually agree uh, to an extension. Once the hearing begins, the board has 15 days to notify the applicant if it will be declaring safe harbor under any of the provisions under state law. And should the board make such a de declaration, the applicant has 15 days to appeal. After the public hearing is closed, the board has 40 days to uh, render a decision unless the parties mutually agree to extend. When the board is preparing a decision, it has three options. One of the things it can do is just grant the application. Another is to grant it subject to various conditions that are designed to protect local needs and local interests. Uh, and third is to deny the project. Uh, any decision by the board may be appealed within 20 days of the issuance of the decision. Uh, and unless the town can demonstrate that it is meeting its obligations in providing affordable housing, an appeal by the applicant is filed with the Housing Appeals Committee uh, by design a developer-friendly platform. A butter appeals are heard at the Superior Court or Land Court. A down, town can demonstrate it is meeting its affordable housing obligations uh, by demonstrating compliance with one of the safe harbor provisions under the enabling state uh, legislation. Uh, 
Uh, this could include having greater than 10% of housing units listed on the subsidized housing index maintained by the state. Uh, it could include having a certain percentage uh, of more than 1.5% of available land dedicated to affordable housing, uh, or there's a similar provision with respect to total land area. Um, and there are a number of others. Uh, the related, uh, so, and we will address those at the very end of the meeting. The applicant needs to demonstrate that it meets the statutory requirements for its submittal, and the applicant will no doubt explain to us the way in which they do that. Um, but much of that is included in their uh, in their written uh, plans, which are on, are on the website, and which I invite you to uh, look at. The board is also able to request funds from the applicant to allow the board to properly and thoroughly review the application and supporting materials by hiring consulting engineers with expertise in areas like traffic and stormwater, utilities and the like. The board can engage a transcription service also uh, to create a written record of the hearings. And in, typically in Arlington, the board does do that. Under certain circumstances, the board can retain a financial consultant uh, to review the uh, project's uh, pro, pro forma. Uh, negotiations and work sessions may occur between the applicant and their consultants and the town and its consultants, but no decisions can be made at those sessions. The board is limited to conditions which could be applied in similar uh, proposed developments pers pursued through regular zoning. The board cannot consider any impact a 40B decision would have on public schools as families are a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. The board cannot reduce the number of overall units unless it demonstrates that the, the necessity to protect the health, safety, and welfare of residents. And the board cannot increase the uh, percentage of affordable units, which is not really relevant here, or the affordability of the units. Only the subsidizing agency can do that. So I've now reached the end. And I can, while I take my breath, I'd like to ask Mr. Haverty if there's anything that I either left out, that there's anything necessary that I left out. Uh, or anything that I got wrong. No, you did You did very, very well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think there was anything I could add to that. Great. All right, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, attorney Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor of Cratton uh, Maker O'Connor and Ingbert PC uh, to introduce the project team and make a presentation to the board and the town uh, expecting, uh, uh, explaining the proposed project, Mary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Members of the board, good evening. Paul, good to see you again. Um, I, on behalf of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, it's my privilege to be able to represent them. As Mr. Hanlon has said, this is an exciting project for a number of reasons that we will go through. Uh, I'd like to first introduce the project team. I think many of you know Erica Schwartz, the executive director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Erica, you can raise your hand there so people can see you. Um, Gabby Geller, who is the development consultant, is also on the call. Uh, our uh, design team is led by Nick Burens from Util Design. Uh, the civil engineer on this project is Sammy Otis Consultants, and Stephen Garvin is the primary contact. Uh, the landscape architect is Offshoots Inc., and we are using uh, niche engineering, Brian Zamolka, you may recall he was the traffic engineer on 1165R Mass Ave, and we've used him for this project as well. Uh, you have a complete uh, application, which includes everything uh, from a control of the site and project eligibility letter and all the plans. I'm sure you are familiar with what the Housing Corporation has done in the town of Arlington. Um, the most recent developments comparable uh, to this with Downing Square, um, which was is now complete and tenanted, the Broadway project um, on Broadway and Capitol Square. That's just uh, some of the units that the Housing Corporation has developed uh, in this town. I would suggest to you that this project is in keeping with that commitment to affordable quality communities in perpetuity. This development consists of 43 residential units and I would um, submit gets Arlington even closer to its necessary thresholds for affordable housing. It's located in a B4 automotive district, as Mr. Hanlon mentioned, and as the zoning board knows, the zoning bylaw specifically contains a provision that says when the ZBA or the ARB has the ability to change an automotive use to some other use in a B4 district, they should um, uh, really seize upon that opportunity. And this is a perfect situation. 
Uh, the project is in alignment with the goals of the town as well as the state to have housing near uh, transit, public transit, uh, retail shops. You have Arlington and Somerville here on both ends. Um, you have the list of waivers that we provided. There are not a tremendous amount of waivers that are necessary for this project because it generally comes within the bylaw for this district by way of height and similar uh, things. Uh, you have the extensive traffic report and that we will get to that another night. Uh, and I would suggest, and I think the board can concur that this proposal is a tremendous improvement over what is there and something which is very much needed. Uh, with respect to the commercial space, uh, there's a proposed 600 square feet of commercial space on the first floor. It is the intention at this point to, for the housing corporation to use that space uh, for its management office. Uh, it's my pleasure um, to represent the housing corporation on this project. We have received, just so the board knows, we have received the April 23rd memorandum and our team will review the comments and the recommendations and at another meeting respond. Uh, we've also, I've also um, communicated with Mr. Hanlon and uh, we're ironing out uh, the number of parking spaces. It's uh, some number based on the bylaw. If you look at uh, 6.15 and 8.24a of between 10 and 39 spaces, uh, depending on what the ZBA does, uh, we are proposing 21 parking spaces in this project. So uh, I would like to turn this over uh, to uh, Nick, who can present the plans, if that's okay with you, Mr. Hanlon. Yes, it's quite welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mary. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that uh, slide deck? Yes, I see nodding heads. All right, great. It's visible now. Great. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, members of the board, for having us uh, to echo everyone's comments. We're very excited about this project. Um, I think actually we're going to start with a, just a brief overview from Erica to introduce the project and the timeline. Um, and then I can jump into the design. Um, so, Erica, if you want to um, give a, a brief overview about the uh, HCA's goals for the project, please, uh, by all means. Sure. So I think Mary really captured it. Um, you you know who we are. I just wanted to say thank you for having us here. We're very excited about the project, um, interested in hearing the feedback and working through this process. Um, and our timeline is really uh, with a goal of going through this process, advancing our designs and applying for the necessary subsidies from the state probably in January of 2024 when, when the state has its next opportunity to apply for those funds. Um, we're hopeful we'll be successful. It's not guaranteed. The state has a lot of demands on its limited funds. Um, but if we are successful at that time, then we could see tenants moving in you know, less than three years from now. Um, so that's our goal and, and this timeline works well with that. So just thank you for having us here and I'll turn it back to Nick. Great, thanks Erica. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself briefly. My name is Nick Behrens. I'm an associate principal at UTL. Uh, we're a 65-person uh, architecture and planning firm in Boston. Uh, I manage our affordable housing practice. We work with uh, CDCs and nonprofit developers like HCA all around the greater Boston area and New England. Um, and really excited to be um, putting together a team for this project and invited by Erica to participate uh, in bringing affordable housing to, to Arlington. I'm joined by Rochelle Ain um, from UTL, who's the project manager and an associate at UTL, and uh, David Sharlakin, who's our uh, project engineer from Sam Yotis Engineering. Um, and David will share some details about the, the civil engineering plan as well at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep my comments uh, as brief as possible, Chairperson, and um, leave plenty of time for, for questions. Um, just to orient everyone to the project, we're uh, right on the Arlington, Somerville, Cambridge border along the Alewife Brook in the middle of the screen here. And um, as I think everyone knows, this is really an ideal location to bring additional housing density to Arlington. Um, this is an area that's been identified for redevelopment in the city's master planning efforts and is adjacent to bus lines, the Massachusetts Avenue uh, commercial corridor, 
not too far from uh, both the red line and the green line extension. We've got a shopping, uh, a grocery store right across the street, um, uh, across the Airway Brook. So really an ideal location, great access to the Greenway and other uh, green spaces all along the Alewife Brook. Um, so really an ideal location to uh, bring affordable housing. Um, the actual site itself um, is, is, you know, fairly modestly sized. There's an existing uh, auto body use that's on there. The building itself takes up about a quarter of the site and the rest is, um, you know, paved parking area and a little bit overgrown and um, neglected at this point. Um, but for those of you that aren't intimately familiar um, with the location, we're sort of in a little pocket here where there are still vestiges of, you know, light industrial use and automotive use along Sunnyside. Um, and we're a little bit set back from um, the residential neighborhood. So, you know, part of what we see here is an opportunity to maybe provide a little bit more density that might be might not be appropriate in the midst uh, of, a, of a residential neighborhood, but to really, um, you know, encourage additional capacity for housing along the Broadway corridor to provide excellent access to the greenway and the bike path and to set a precedent for, um, you know, future redevelopment uh, in this district. Um, just a quick snapshot of what the site looks like today. As I mentioned, it's a, uh, it was an existing uh, auto body shop, I think had been the, that same use historically all the way back to the 1920s. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that business is no longer um, uh, operating at this point. Uh, and the lot itself is sort of overgrown. There's been some stockpiling of debris and stuff like that. So uh, very, very underutilized at the moment. Um, we went through an initial, you know, sort of capacity analysis effort with Erica and her team in the fall and made our initial submissions to the state to determine eligibility for the 40B process. And, you know, really the core metrics of the project haven't changed since then. Um, we tried, as Mary mentioned, to work very closely within the existing zoning as much as possible. So the height, the overall mass, the FAR really is in keeping with what the zoning allows. Um, and, you know, we've tried to um, provide open space, to provide bike parking, to provide a certain level of articula uh, architectural articulation to the building and keeping with the spirit of the zoning code uh, as a way to uh, make this building as contextual um, and appropriate for the neighborhood as possible. Uh, I'll walk through the floor plans briefly. Um, on the ground floor plan, uh, you'll see in blue here, the sort of interior area of the building and then in gray, the parking, which is underneath the footprint of the building above. So really the entire site is taken up with the building. Um, the parking is open air. The blue area is interior condition space. Um, so we've got our main uh, entrance to the building here, sort of on the, the left-hand side of the page with a residential lobby, a property management office and meeting room for residents and uh, social service providers to use. Um, we have a trash room on the ground floor. Uh, we have some interior bike parking here, as well as additional exterior bike parking in the back of the parking area here and tucked into the front of the parking area. Um, and then, you know, the typical sort of service spaces that uh, we need to run a building this size, electrical rooms, elevator machine rooms, that type of thing. Uh, you'll see here the uh, commercial office space that Mary mentioned previously. Um, and as she discussed, the intention at this point is for HCA to occupy that space um, as part of their ongoing operations in Arlington. Um, the second floor, uh, you, we start to uh, have our residential units and you'll see there's a generous elevator lobby that comes up here in the middle of the plan that provides direct access to uh, a very generous community room that will be available for the residents to use and potentially um, available to be booked by the outside community and uh, have um, you know members of the community come in and host events here as well. And that provides direct access to um, an open space roof deck here, um, which is really, I think, one of the core features and amenities of this building and something that we're really excited about. Um, part of the uh, thinking about, you know, the site plan was really obviously to maximize the amount of affordable housing that we could provide on the site. Um, but we did want to make sure that residents had access to green space um, directly on the site. 
And as I mentioned, you know, there's excellent um, adjacency to the bike path and all these other great open spaces in the neighborhood. So we felt like it was appropriate here to maybe limit, um, you know, some of the on-site uh, open space and really use that as a focal point um, to uh, frame the, you know, the residential spaces and the, the community spaces around that. Um, so you'll see typically on the upper floors, there's a, a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, you know, pursuant to the state's funding guidelines, we're biased a little bit more heavily towards the larger units to provide room for families. Um, and on the upper uh, third and fourth floors, the plan is identical. Uh, those units just stack going up. And then on the fifth floor, you'll see here, <clears throat> excuse me, on the front of the building, you've stepped the building back a little bit from the lower floors. And that was, again, sort of a nod to uh, some of those step back provisions that are called for in the zoning. Um, we asked for some relief for specific dimensions for that, but we really wanted to um, use that device uh, as a means to try to mitigate uh, height and presence on the street and make the building feel like it sat in the neighborhood a little bit better. Um, on the roof, we have a mechanical penthouse area, which will primarily be used for um, a central domestic hot water plant that'll serve the entire building. And there'll be some exterior, um, you know, rooftop mechanical equipment that you'll see in this hatched area that's generally located in the center of the plan, both to um, eliminate noise transfer to the units below, but also make sure that we don't have any uh, uh, direct sight lines from the street to see that equipment. And then, you know, the majority of the roof is really dedicated for a photovoltaic array, um, which we uh, are doing on a lot of our projects and which we're excited to include here as well. Um, there are a couple sort of key design principles that we've been trying to adhere to as we develop the architecture and, you know, meet with uh, neighbors and meet with uh, the town department heads. Um, so I'll just review those quickly here. I think, you know, probably the most fundamental one is really about creating a new street edge and street presence along Sunnyside. Uh, as you saw on the photos, <clears throat> there's no sidewalk currently. There's no curb line. There's you know very little uh, in the way of making this a pedestrian friendly street. And that was one of the things that we heard loud and clear from the neighbors was you know this could be a real improvement to the character of the street and to make it uh, a much more walkable and pleasant place to be both uh, in the daytime and in the evening. So we really tried to pay close attention to that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we're making a number of moves here to try to break down both the breadth and the height of the building in a way that makes it feel a little bit more contextual. We have, you know, sort of a precedent for some taller redevelopment here along Broadway where we're trying to make some alignments with our step back there. And then also sort of um, frame, um, you know, portions of the elevation in a way that read a little bit more like the smaller scale, you know, one, two, and three family buildings that are uh, around in the neighborhood. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, really the the open space here in the roof deck, I think, is a great sort of focal point for the project, both uh, as a, a place for residents to gather and to use, but really also as a, a visual amenity to the neighborhood and folks on the street. And we think having that uh, space face out onto the street, having it be sort of a green buffer to the project and to the street edge is a really nice feature of the design. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a subsequent conversation, I think, at sort of a more detailed plan developed in coordination with our landscape architect, but I wanted to share some preliminary thinking about the streetscape. And we did um, get some initial feedback from the town engineer and department heads about this design as well. So you'll see, um, you know, we're trying to sort of pack in a lot of activity and activate what's going on here on the sidewalk. So adding new street trees, obviously down the length of the sidewalk, um, adding the sidewalk itself, of course, uh, really limiting the width of the curb cut so that that doesn't take up too much of the frontage of the building. Um, and then you'll see here this idea about sort of, you know, creating really what's a almost like a front porch for the building. So we're dealing with a little bit of a grade change across the site. It's taller on the left hand or higher on the left hand side of the page and shorter on the right hand side of the page. So um, finding ways to use steps and sort of slope surfaces to uh, mitigate that grade change and, you know, provide a little bit of an elevated spot where we could have some seating, uh, a little bit of a sheltered entrance, which we think is going to be a really nice feature. Uh, and then again, just finding opportunities to add additional landscaping and greenery along the edge of the building. Uh, so here's a view uh, of the building as you would see it uh, head on on Sunny Street, uh, on Sunnyside Street. 
Um, and you'll see the main building entrance here with that front porch area that I was talking about. Here's the um, community uh, office space over here on the left, the parking over here on the right. And we've, this is sort of a, you know, version three or four of the parking design. We've really been trying to pay attention to how this is evolving architecturally. Obviously we wanna provide parking for the residents, but we also wanna do it in a way that uh, isn't a, a negative impact, both from a, a visual standpoint and from a safety standpoint. Um, so we got some great feedback uh, through some of our abutters meetings about ways to both enclose this, but also make it feel more open, uh, make it feel incorporated with the architecture. And I think, you know, maybe most importantly, finding a way to light it in the evening and make it feel like it's really an integral part of the building. Um, so that's something that, you know, continues to evolve. And I know there were some comments in the uh, the board's memorandum specifically about that. And that's I think it's something that we're actively trying to address with the, the design right now. Um, here is another view of the project from Broadway looking towards Sunnyside. Uh, so again, you can see uh, the main building entrance sort of here in the center and this idea of sort of a stepping and um, pulling of the front facade to create alignments with adjacent buildings to break down the overall height and, and breadth of the building uh, in a way that feels a little bit more um, congruous with the, with the neighborhood. Uh, and a view here looking back on Sunnyside towards Broadway in the distance there with the cemetery where you can see, uh, again, some of the um, architectural motifs that we're trying to deploy to screen the parking and to activate um, that portion of the building, tie it together architecturally with um, the open space up above um, and with the storefront and building entrance uh, further down the street. So I think that's the gist of the architectural presentation. I'm going to turn it over to David to briefly review some of the civil engineering aspects of the project, um, grading, utilities, and stormwater, and then we'd be happy to take your questions. Hello, I'm David Charlakin with Sam Evans Consultants, uh, here to present the state utilities and stormwater design for the project. Uh, we have received the town engineer comments. Um, they all seem reasonable, and we'll, we'll be making revisions to address them. Um, on the screen, you can see the site layout with the uh, building located, the bottom left of the plan, and the covered parking to the north and east. Uh, new sidewalk will also be provided along Sunnyside Avenue with street trees. Um, if we can. Skip to the next slide, uh, utilities. Oh, it, yeah, okay, utilities. Um, <clears throat> so all new utilities will be provided for the, for the site. The uh, new domestic water and fire protection will be brought off of the main in Sunnyside Avenue. <clears throat> the sanitary sewer will connect to the <clears throat> existing manhole in, uh, in Sunnyside Avenue. Um, Water collected by uh, area drains inside the parking garage will be routed through a sediment and oil separator prior to connecting to the sanitary panel. <clears throat> um, the electrical transform the electrical service will be run underground from an existing utility pool across across the street to a new pad mounted transformer, <clears throat> uh, where the building power will be run from. <clears throat> and the gas service is located to the uh, left of the, the building off of the main and Sunnyside Avenue as well. <clears throat> the stormwater, we are also proposing a stormwater management system that will meet DEP and local regulations with BMPs, including area drains, mammals, uh, cast iron pipes, an infiltration system with HDPE chambers, and a uh, dry well. <clears throat> the overflow connection on the site will be made from the dry well to an existing 10 inch PVC pipe at the east corner of the lot. That's all for my presentation. We have uh, received the town engineer's comments and uh, we will be making the revisions to the plans. Thank you. Great.
Thanks, David. I think that's uh, everything that we have for you uh, as far as the presentation goes. So happy to go back and review any of those materials or take your questions. So thank you for your presentation. The uh, This is a point where the, if the board has questions, this is the time to uh, uh, ask them. Uh, there are two general principles I'd just like everybody to try to observe. One is, is that this is an introductory session. Uh, and uh, so it may be a time to begin to 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 get ideas or issues or whatever out onto the out onto the floor so that we can work on them uh, going forward. Uh, but also, uh, there'll be lots of there'll be several other hearings, and we don't need to explore every any anything in depth. Really, we'll get into those things later on. Mr. Klein, thank you very much, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I had a few different questions. Several of these items, I think, were captured by some of the town's comments as well. But um, there were different things that I wanted to make sure that um, the applicant was thinking of as, as we move forward in this process. Uh, one of them has to do with the, the open space on the second floor. Um, it currently has a single means of egress, which limits the occupancy to 49. Um, and I would absolutely encourage the applicant applicant to discuss that design with inspectional services um, before we move too far down the process, just to make sure that uh, that aligns with um, with their interpretation of egress, egress guidelines uh, for this use. Um, we had a similar project recently that had an outdoor space on the second floor. And um, in the end, we uh, we did need to add us, they needed to add a second means of egress. So I just want to make sure that that gets addressed um, so that, that you don't get caught by that uh, later on. Yeah, no, um, your, I really your appreciate summary uh, reflects our understanding of the issues and that is our plan currently would be to limit um, the occupancy to, to, you know, only have one means of egress. Okay. So I just, <clears throat> I would encourage you to have that conversation with inspectional services. Sure. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that you're creating a sidewalk. Um, this building has had, has, this is the third time this building, I believe, has appeared before the Zoning Board of Appeals um, over the last 10 years um, for a variety of things that never happened. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, um, to actually having a, a clean sidewalk that's flat and level and uh, can be utilized. So I think that that's a very nice thing to see. Um, I am a little concerned about the visibility um, coming out of the garage and the width of the proposed garage opening. Uh, I just want to make sure that that those are well thought through. Um, so because that obviously that's going to be sort of the, the pinch point where all these different uh, modes of transportation come together. And I really want to make sure that we we have a, a full understanding of how that's going to be uh, managed. Um, and that also sort of extends out uh, to Broadway. Uh, there is a um, the uh, eighty seven bus stop that's heading towards Arlington Center is on this is on the project side of Broadway, uh, but the eighty seven heading in the opposite direction is on the opposite side of Broadway. And there's uh, the nearest crosswalks are several hundred feet away, um, either back down at the uh, at the Parkway or farther up the block. And uh, one of the recommendations was that the, the applicant consider creating a crosswalk at broad, on Broadway at that location. Um, there, last night at uh, town meeting, there was a presentation by a local uh, neighborhood group that is looking at safety improvements along Broadway. And there may be some synergy there between that group and what this project is considering. And so um, I would, strongly encourage uh, some investigation of, as to whether a, a crosswalk in this area would be uh, would be a possibility. It would be a great amenity to uh, not only this project, but also to the neighborhood behind it. Um, and then the only other question I had at this time, I note you are including a gas service, and I just wanted to confirm uh, what would be served by the gas service. Sure. So, um... I think we obviously mentioned in our materials and you queued in on the fact that we're pursuing passive house certification, which I think um, uh, coincidentally we had been intending to do. And then the town went ahead and um, adopted the specialized 
stretch code, which made it a requirement. So we're excited to be complying with that new requirement. Um, I think our preliminary thinking at this point is to use the gas service to service the domestic hot water plant. Um, that continues to be the most cost effective and efficient way to um, provide hot water for buildings of this size. Um, the uh, options for doing it in an ener energy efficient way following the passive out standard are fairly limited um, beyond centralized gas plants. There's some newer technology to do it through air source heat pumps that are electric or to do it on an individualized electric resistance basis, but it becomes a lot more challenging and both costly uh, from a first cost perspective and costly to operate. So I think that's something we're going to be continuing to evaluate through the design process is whether or not it makes sense to be an early adopter for a system like that that will allow us to be 100% electric or if we um, plan for future electrification, which is a prerequisite of the passive house standard and something that we would be doing anyway. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. Okay, are there any other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I just had uh, one question, and it's more for informational purposes. So when the um, plans were shown, the second floor, second level showed, I believe, a laundry room, uh, if I'm correct. And it looked yep. like there were two washers and dryers. Are the units themselves going to be plumbed to allow for someone to have a washer dryer set up? Uh, in this case, probably not. We were providing common area laundry on every residential floor at a ratio that, um, you know, we determined to be appropriate with, uh, in coordination with HCA and their property manager. So it's roughly about one set of machines per every eight residential units. So I think we're actually a little bit over that. Okay. Um, I, that was my next question about whether there were any sort of industry standards with regard to the numbers? Because honestly, it just seems a little low, especially if people have families with kids. Yeah, so that, that's roughly, that's a fairly consistent standard that we've run across in, in our affordable housing work. And um, it's it's fairly uncommon to provide any unit laundry for these subsidized units. Um, sometimes we provide one larger laundry room for the entire building here. We're doing it on a floor by floor basis. I think that's something that we actually got direct feedback from our property management company is being a preference for us. So you'll see, you know, going up through the building, every floor has their own, you know, individual laundry room. So um, there'll be uh, a pair of machines for every, uh, you know, eight, nine units on the floor. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? I have a couple of one. One is the, the, um, the, um, Parking uh, parking uh, vehicles uh, is base is 0.49 per dwelling unit. So, um, and I'm wondering what experience you have with basically providing one parking space for every for every two dwelling units, uh, and in particular, what what is the situation at Downing Square and uh, at 177 Broadway? It, it it does seem a little bit a little bit light. Uh, particularly since many people who live in uh, affordable housing don't have jobs necessarily downtown, and sometimes the transit system does, is not very friendly to their needs. I can answer that. Um, actually, I, I can't answer it fully, and I can get information for you, but we don't have a one-to-one -one parking ratio at any of our other sort of larger developments, Capitol Square or the two Downing Square sites. Um, we have, I think, actually a, a slightly higher ratio at 117 Broadway, um, where it's a, a much smaller building, but not all, we, we require our tenants to get parking stickers. So we, we know how many people have requested that um, and not all of the spaces there are taken by a, a parking sticker request. Um, so, we think this is appropriate. It's actually a higher ratio than some of our properties. And, and we do have tenants who absolutely do need cars, but a lot of our tenants do not have cars. Um, so we, we think it is an appropriate ratio. But I can, I can also get those, I, I can forward those exact numbers if the, board, if the ZBA is interested. 
That would be very helpful to see. That would be very helpful. And, and I might also point out, if I may, that you may recall that the project that you approved, the 40B at Westminster Ave, there was no parking there um, on site. And that has not been an issue. Okay. I'd also like to add from a funding perspective that the state, DHCD in particular, has had a lot of, they've pushed back a lot about the cost of parking, particularly for um, moderate to very low income units and questioning the, you know, the feasibility and the question of applying resources to additional fun, um, parking spaces when across projects across the state, they found that they are not fully utilized. So th this is something that the state would give us an issue about. They, they don't like one-to-one -one parking, um, especially as you get closer to the city. Right. Well, I actually am not so much concerned about the one-to-one -one part as, as just 0.49 and whether where that fits in the spectrum from zero to one. And of course, it could be either too much or too little. The, I noticed that with the staff comments suggest that uh, it would be nice if you had more bicycle parking. And I, I wonder if it would make sense for you to have even less vehicle parking and use some of that space to deal with the uh, deficiency in bicycle parking. I mean, eventually you want to have a balance, right? And and that works for the people who are working in this building and work for the neighborhood as well. Um, I guess the other question I have is that under, under the stretch code, you're going to be required to do pre-wiring um, for 20% of the vehicular parking spaces. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering how that physically works. You've got a relatively cramped parking area and uh, it, I guess this is not a time to get into that in detail, but it would be nice to see, you know, visually how it is that you would accommodate that requirement and, and what that does to the to the space that's located in the parking area. So I have no more. Um, the uh, It's now time to... Uh, introduced for public comment. I was planning actually on having a break here, uh, but we're doing so well uh, that maybe we'll try doing that a little bit later on and uh, and start the public comment uh, uh, now. So before we get into public comment, I, there are some guidelines that you may find helpful in making comments effective. Um, first of all, public comments and questions will be only taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for purposes of informing our decision. So this is not an occasion uh, for having, you know, back and forth conversations uh, that leave the, the board in the position of, of mere audience. Um, the chair strongly encourages individual speakers to limit their comments and use their time to provide comment uh, related to the topics discussed at, at this hearing. Please note that there'll be multiple hearings in this uh, case, so that if you don't have time to unburden yourself with everything that you're thinking, there will be other opportunities where we're for getting into more details on the particular issues that we just touched on lightly uh, today. Um, the chair uh, will encourage the, uh, and does encourage the uh, people to provide written comments as well, uh, they have a tendency to last in the mind a lot longer than the oral comments do, and, and the board finds them particularly uh, useful. Um, the chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom, who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raise hand button um, in the participants tab. You will be called upon by the meeting host. You can unmute yourself and you'll be asked to give your name and address for the record. And you'll be given up to five minutes for your questions and, and comments. Um, I'd encourage you to, if, to go a little light on the time. Five minutes is a limit, not a target. And uh, it would be, uh, there are a lot of people who like to, who will have a chance to speak and this isn't going to be the end of the line for anyone. But uh, so the idea is just to try to get as many people into the queue as, as we can. Um, all questions have to be addressed through the chair. And please remember to speak uh, clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps to generate an accurate re record. For those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate that you'd like to speak. 
Uh, when called upon, you may unmute your line and you should identify yourself by uh, name and address for the record. Uh, and then the rules apply to phone uh, participants in the same way they do for participants on Zoom. Uh, once all public questions and comments have been addressed or we've reached, uh, let's say, nine or ten after nine, um, we will, uh, uh, with the public comment period for this evening, will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for the project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. I will say that when we get to the period of, of around 10 after nine, if it looks as if there's a whole lot of people waiting in line, uh, we, we, we will take a break and, uh, and give others an opportunity to, uh, uh, to finish up because this is, this is a time to get everything out on the table and uh, uh, so we're not going to be overly stringent about the uh, about the timing as long as as long as we're not making as long as we're continuing to make progress. So that said, uh, the first person on my list uh, here is Steve Moore. Uh, so Steve, unmute yourself and identify yourself for the record. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I want to apologize. I, I arrived late. There's a lot going on in town tonight. And um, so I'm trying to do multiple things. But uh, so forgive me if uh, the, the points that I bring up or the questions asked really have already been answered in the presentation. I, I hope not. But, um, I guess my first question, uh, Mr. Chair, to you is what is this uh, area currently zoned for? B4. That's automotive uses. Right. All right. Automotive uses. And right now, the the old Hanson and Tilton uh, garage is there, and next to it, is, just down the street, is the Arlmont Oil Company. Right. Um, I know that when this is when this came up before, there was lots of uh, back and forth questions about um, the previous use and how the site was going to require some perhaps remediation from its previous use, having had paint booths and uh, uh, utilities that supported. Uh, welding and, and all sorts of things. And also this back parking lot or, or the back area that was a storage area for vehicles. Um, all this to say, to kind of provide some context to my question, uh, I guess I'm wondering for you, Mr. Chair, and the applicant, why is it the applicant feels that um, folks either moderate income or, or a normal market rate income would want to live in this previous industrial type zone with perhaps issues with, uh, uh, I don't know about dumping, but the soil probably is pretty contaminated and there's an oil company just down the street. Why is it people want to live there? I guess I would ask. So, I, Jeff? I, Mr. Hanlon, I can answer yes. that. We've had a phase one and a phase two um, environmental study done, and the site is clean. And that means test, uh, Mr. Chair, that means test borings in all the areas uh, of that storage uh, parking lot area? Whatever the, the, whatever the consultant deemed necessary and appropriate, the reality is that no bank is going to lend on this property unless it's a clean site in, in any event. That the, you know that the housing corporation has previously uh, purchased a heavily contaminated site at Downing Square and cleaned it up and built a project there. So this is uh, this is a non-issue. The the, issue, the contamination issue. It's a non-issue. Okay, well that, that's good news, Mr. Chair. I, I would uh, suggest there be sufficient budget set aside for when you start digging around and pulling up stuff that if contamination is discovered if unexpected conditions are discovered, that uh, they can be handled uh, as part of the project budget. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Mongold. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Neil Mongold. I'm a board member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And I just have a brief statement uh, that's from the collective individual board members of the Housing Corporation. We are very pleased to present our development to you tonight of 43 apartments at 10 Sunnyside Avenue in East Arlington. 
as you know, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, HCA, is a nonprofit community-based development corporation with board members who all live or work in Arlington and with a broad membership throughout the town. HCA owns 150 apartments, as has been mentioned previously, throughout Arlington, ranging from uh, widely scattered two-family homes throughout the town to our newest development, which has been mentioned, of 48 apartments. For over 37 years, HCA's mission has been providing and advocating for affordable housing in our amazing, vibrant town as a way to encourage social and economic diversity in our town. And 10 Sunnyside Ave will be an important development for Arlington in that in that manner and for this neighborhood off of Broadway particularly. We are bringing a thoughtful design that will enhance the street and bring new life to a long vacant site. This project will be a small but important contribution, we feel, to easing the critical shortage of affordable housing in our town. As part of our efforts to understand and to better uh, respond to any neighborhood concerns, HCA's staff and board have held two neighborhood and a butter meetings so far. HCA has also had discussions with the select board, the Arlington Redevelopment Board, the town's planning department, and with many interested stakeholders throughout the town. In our meetings, we heard comments about the need to bring new life and streetscape improvements along Sunnyside. We heard about the potential impact on traffic and parking we heard about the effect of the new five-story building on the street. And we heard questions about the many energy efficient and sustainability features of our project. And HCA staff and board has worked with our architects to address many of these issues. And we will continue to listen carefully to all the comments. As a long-term community-based organization, we will respond to the greatest extent possible uh, to any design or programming issues that are, that are that arise from these conversations and future uh, meetings. The need for high quality, energy efficient, affordable housing in Arlington is truly overwhelming. This project is a sign of hope for many, many people. From the moment that HCA's board heard about the availability of this site, we were thrilled about the possibilities. And we think that our project will be a wonderful new neighbor on Sunnyside Ave. And on behalf of the board of HCA, I again want to express our strong support for this project on Sunnyside Ave. And we ask for the board to support our application. We look forward to continuing this dialogue and we, we will take into consideration all of your comments and feedback to ensure the best possible future or 10 Sunnyside. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I just want to uh, read off briefly the names of uh, board members of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Uh, Danielle Sherry, Jack Cooper, Abidnia Curve, Tom Nee, who is our board president, Makelia Parker, Matthew Pierce, Kinjal Singh, Frank Tadley, John Wallach, Deirdre Westcott, and Laura Wiener. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mungold. I think I may, when I first recognized you, have neglected to ask you to give your name and address for the record. And just in case, could you do yes. that now? Sure. Uh, again, it's Neil Mongold. I uh, live at 12 Brattle Place in Arlington. Great. Thank you very much. The next person on the list is Kelda Fontenot, if that's the right way to pronounce your name. Is, is Ms. Fontenot there? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I, hi, my name is Kelda Fontenot. You were pronouncing it correct, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'm really concerned. I, I'm housing. Ms. Fontenot, oh, could you could you ident put your, your identify yourself by address as well? Oh, sure. I live at the Broadway Downing uh, Square Initiative, built by HCA in their latest project. My address Great. is 114 Lowell Street. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I really appreciate the board's thoughtful comments and questions um, about the sidewalk and about the parking and everything. We are having um, some serious issues here that have gone unaddressed 
at our Broadway or, or at our Downing Square. I don't live on Broadway. They refuse that. Um, at our Downing Square place, we have problems with parking. Um, we have problems with uh, Peabody, who manages all of HCA's properties, um, enforcing the no smoking indoors, which is a, a term for the actual funding. Um, we have problems with the trash room. There is not enough trash, like barrels. There's not enough room in the trash room. And when the trash goes out, it covers up the whole sidewalk. So I think, I hope that people will um, consider asking about like, where will the trash be put out if these sidewalks are particularly small? Right now, I encourage the board or anybody concerned to drive through here, you know, it's a public area and see that our trash is out right now. It's been out for over 24 hours. It's out usually five days a week on the sidewalk, which makes the sidewalk very inaccessible. Um, and is against, of course, the, the health code. Um, and I encourage anybody to stand underneath the supposed fire lane and smell the marijuana smoke coming out of the building, which is perfectly legal, except it's a no smoking building. And the funding could be revoked because due to the federal funding, even though marijuana is completely legal here in Massachusetts, it's not federally legal. And this has been going on for the entire year people have been living here. Um, there have been numerous complaints from numerous tenants and retaliation response. So I hope that people keep up the conversation open. Um, the, also, the contamination is a problem here. This was a previous landfill. And even though there were plenty of testing done, um, I spoke with the EPA, EPA person who was in charge of a lot of the testing. There was never any interior testing done here. And if you look at the history of affordable housing and landfills, almost inevitably, when things are disturbed and when things are built and enclosed, um, the gases and stuff rise into the interior. So what needs to be tested is the interior air quality. That still hasn't happened here and the windows don't open. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to keep this conversation open. I appreciate everybody's thoughts. I think this is a much needed thing and I hope that it can be done by somebody else who takes better care of the properties that they already have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Contino. The next person on our list is Roberto Roberto Acosta. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Roberto Acosta. I live on 39 Michael Street. I uh, thank you for your time. I do have concerns about the traffic as the traffic uh, was done while we're in order of uh, state emergency. So the flow is not what it is and it's already increasing. Furthermore, um, Somerville is restricting uh, over Broadway. They're adding bike lanes. And I'm assuming at some point, Arlington may follow suit with what they did in uh, Mass Avenue. We'll lose um, more lanes on that side. And just with the amount of cars right now, it's impossible to turn onto Broadway. I find myself circling around my street to get where I need to go. Um, the transportation, I take it every day. It's definitely not what it should be. Uh, 87 and the red line are really slow. So that should be taken into consideration as well. There may need to be an increase in bus service. Um, second, I if we're going to build housing for residents of Arlington, I would like them to have open space in Arlington and be part of the community of Arlington. The idea that they have to travel to Cambridge and Dillboy, I know that, I mean, they know it's Somerville, but still <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen with a building that they're going to do in front. It's already a space that the town doesn't, we don't control, but rather we have that under our own control in terms of space. I think the building is a little too big for the site. Uh, we're basically going to add a lot of families in a short amount of space. And I think that's reflected on uh, all the variances that are being asked on, on the building code. And uh, to second uh, the parking, I, we, we do have access to supermarkets, but uh, there's really no pharmacy in the area. You have to drive to a pharmacy. There are other stores that you need to get access that you do need a car, um, that there's no real easy way to get to. And uh, finally, if uh, uh, there are no bike lanes to go on, on Broadway, so that's something to consider as we start uh, moving to less cars or more bike transportation, crossing over to to Somerville and even riding on Broadway and Arlington is, is, a, is a challenge on a bicycle. The road's not well maintained and uh, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to navigate in the winter. 
And uh, my only concern, I guess, uh, along with the size of the building, I think there'll be a lot of shadows cast on Sunnyside, which is kind of one of the only good things the street has going for it, the fact that it gets sun, uh, is also that uh, we're, we seem to be kind of segregating the, neighbor, the, the town by income. I, I, I think uh, if I look around my neighborhood, uh, we seem to be putting between the two areas a lot of uh, income segregation. And I, I don't think that's that's necessarily good for the future and for the schools. And, and that, that I think is something that should be evaluated as well. Uh, we think there, there's a number of affordable housing around the area already. And, and I'm just concerned how that the effects of socioeconomic effects on that and on the school. We already probably have the school that has the highest uh, teacher to student ratio in the, in the town. So, so those, those are just some concerns. Uh, I, I am worried about the, the size of the building. I think probably two floors too big. But I do think the the project looks good. I like the pa passive aspect of it. Uh, I just the size and the lack of parking are what concerns me. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Costa. Let me just reiterate what I said at the beginning, though. It, it's important for everybody to understand that one of the things the board cannot take into consideration is the impact uh, of new housing on schools. Uh, that that would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. So. That is an issue that will not be before the board. As for the rest, uh, we appreciate your views. Um, Ms. Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and other members um, of the board. I, uh, My name is Shelley Dean. I live at 7 Cleveland Street in East Arlington, about four blocks from this development. Um, and in terms of other disclosure, um, uh, I am a member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington's Real Estate Committee and also a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee for the town. Um, though I'm speaking um, not on behalf of those organizations, I'm speaking um, on behalf of myself. And I want to um, say that even though I am not a direct abutter of this property, I really consider this uh, a... Um, very, very much part of my neighborhood. This is a neighborhood I walk through all the time. I, I, um, I'm very, very familiar with it, and I'm very familiar with just how convenient a location this is, whether it be for public transit, whether it be for grocery stores, the bike path, the greenway, the access to the public library, walkable to elementary schools, to medical services. It really seems like it's an ideal location for affordable housing. Um, and there is just such an overwhelmingly critical need for affordable housing. So I'm really, so I'm, I don't have any questions. I'm really speaking on behalf uh, uh, in, in full support of this project. And um, because of um, my interest in energy efficiency and in renewable energy, I also am so pleased that this is gonna be built to pass as house standards. Um, and I am also very um, pleased with the fact that there will be feature that that the um, that the design really took into account many of the abutters' concerns about the current condition of the streetscape and the fact that the building pulls back a little bit from the street and that there's um, really much more of a sense of a neighborhood and a residential feel for the um, front of the building. Admittedly, a multifamily um, feel, but a, but a residential feel. Um, I'm very pleased to be associated with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And I, I know and expect that the Housing Corporation of Arlington will continue to take a butter's concerns into effect as, as the design continues. So that's my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Dean. Um, if I could just, I wonder if Mr. In mentioning Passive House, I thought that it might be helpful if Mr. Burns could, could uh, I mean, that obviously is something that reduces energy consumption and has a public benefit, but I'm wondering if it has any benefit for the uh, tenants in the, in the building as well. Sure, absolutely happy to speak to that. Yeah, I think um, one of the great things about the Passive House standard is that, um, you know, it's very focused on both um, energy efficiency and, and the use of energy in the operation of the building, but also in providing healthy indoor environments. So 
the entire building will have uh, 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 energy recovery ventilation system to provide fresh air to the building. Um, there are a number um, of benefits to, you know, the design of the building envelope to provide better acoustic separation from environmental noise. Um, so really, you know, uh, there are quite a, a number of measures that are taken just uh, through the nature of getting the project certified through Passive House that result in, uh, you know, better uh, livable outcomes for the residents in the building. Thank you. So the next person up is uh, Laura Wiener, but uh, if I could ask people who have already spoken to to bring to take their hand to lower their hands, uh, it becomes easier to call on the next on the next people because otherwise you you sort of retain your position first in line. Sweener. Hi, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. This is Laura Wiener. Um, I'm a board member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and I live at 73 Jason Street. Um, I strongly support this affordable housing project for a number of reasons. First, unlike most comprehensive permits, this one exceeds all state requirements for both affordable housing and also for the income criteria. Um, the, the income that is being targeted is 60% and below of median income, whereas most comprehensive permits target 80% of median. Um, I think there's general agreement that housing prices are too high and feel out of control. Rapidly rising home purchase prices are out of reach for so many, which creates more demand for rental units, pushing up those prices as well. Renters with lower incomes are hurt the most by this dynamic, and this is exactly the demographic that will be served by this project, low and very low income renters. The other reason I think this is a great project is its location. It is well served by bus lines, open space, and its proximity to stop and shop and other services. It's the kind of location where some residents won't need a car. Sunnyside is both industrial and residential. This particular location had a vacant auto body repair shop with no trees and no sidewalk. This proposal will be a big improvement for the appearance of the lot and will bring street life to the corner and customers to local businesses. Um, all in all, it will bring many benefits to the town and I hope the board will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wiener. The next person on our list is Jennifer Seuss. Or could you Sorry. lower your Hi. hand? Yes, I could. Oh, yeah. I'll lower my hand too. Hi, thank you. Um, so I very briefly, I just wanted to say how excited I am about this project. I, Jennifer Seuss, I live at 45 Teal Street and I am right across the cemetery from this project. So I'm, I'm there all the time. It's, it's part of my neighborhood. Um, I'm especially excited about the addition of sidewalk and green space, which I think is now, um, about the sort of deeper affordability uh, requirements than are true in many projects. And um, just wanted to quickly note, I was on the school committee for six years, uh, we have about 185 fewer elementary school students than we had uh, a few years ago. So we we do have, you know, extra capacity in the schools, and that's not a reason to uh, necessarily support or oppose a project. Uh, we want to welcome all people into our community, including people with uh, children, but but just to say that it, it won't place, place an undue stress on our community. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Seuss. Next person on the list is Kate Casa. Hi, thank you Welcome. very much for um, allowing me to speak and for taking the time to review this project. Um, my name is Kate Casa and I've lived at 62 Wollaston Avenue for about 25 years. I am also a um, member of the Real Estate Committee for the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm very excited about this project. Seeing more affordable housing created here in Arlington is extremely extremely important to me. The need is so great, both for members of our value community um, who are unable to stay here because the rents are crazy high and cost to buy a home is just out of their limits. Uh, and to many low and, and moderate income families across the Commonwealth who really just can't find a place to, to live, call home. Um, I love Arlington and I, I we chose to buy our home here and raise our family here because of this community's values. 
And I feel Sunnyside, it, this development is it reflects those values that we were attracted to 25 years ago. I really don't wanna see Arlington become a town where only the selected few can live here. A community with economic and social diversity is really vital to the heart of what this community has represented. And I'd like to um, try to keep that or at least bring it back or something. I mean, we all know the costs are insane right now. Um, Sunnyside is 100% affordable to low and moderate income residents. I'm thrilled about that. It's a great location, in my opinion. It's a, you know, it's an opportunity for people to have safe quality housing where, you know, there's an, an you know, it's really a, a pretty eyesore site at the moment. Uh, it's been thoughtfully designed and, and it is, I think, quite suitable for the um, density that uh, we're proposing, that HCA is proposing. Uh, I think it's beautiful, a beautiful building and I love the open space on the second floor and the way the uh, sidewalk opens up and you know this idea of trying to have a front, front porch to the street. Uh, proud of how the HCA has tried to address feedback from the community and I know they will continue to do that. Um, I hope I hope that you'll approve this uh, project and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you Ms. Custer for your testimony. Uh, the next person on our list is Jason Forney. Good evening um, members of the board. Thank you. Well, my name is Jason Forney and I live at 545 Summer Street, um, three or four blocks from the Housing Corporation's project at Downing Square, which has been a good addition to our neighborhood. Um, I'd like to thank the HCA and the designers and the project team for putting this project forward. In my view, it aligns really well with the goals that were set forth in the, um, the town's affordable housing production plan. Um, which was, which I think is widely supported and created with a lot of input from um, people who live in our town. I think this is a great project, a good place for density, um, a huge improvement over the current conditions. And I think it's a responsive and contextual design um, that would fit very nicely in this location and provide 43 homes um, for people who, um, 43 new homes and a well-designed and sustainable building. Um, I really like the way that the architects have um, provided parking, but um, screened it well, and it kind of led to the creation of that great outdoor space on the roof. Um, I also appreciate that the majority of these um, apartment homes will be two and three bedrooms for families. Uh, with regards to some of the things that people have brought up tonight, I think that um, you know, anytime you can re redevelop and remediate a brownfield site or a potentially dirty site, um, that's actually a good thing and a much better alternative to leaving it the way that it is. Um, so personally, I'm not concerned about the size of the building, the increase in traffic, increase in shadows or the amount of parking. I'd be very proud to have this in my town and urge the board to approve the project as a great example of how Arlington um, can contribute and lead to the dire need for quality housing um, in the metro area. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Forney. Uh, the next person on our list is Mary McCartney. Hi, thanks for having this hearing. Um, my name's Mary McCartney. I live at 35 Michael Street, which would be right around the corner uh, from this uh, site. Um, I agree that we need more affordable housing in this town, absolutely, uh, but I do have concerns about the height and size of this building. It does, in my mind, it doesn't quite fit, that, that that height doesn't really fit with uh, the rest of the buildings in the, in the area. Um, and I would really um, encourage you to, if you haven't already, drive down Sunnyside at rush hour, morning and evening rush hour. Um, uh, the traffic is is pretty complicated. Um, I hope, I, I, I guess I, one thing I would hope is that you would consider having like a, a, a no parking zone right in front of the building and in front of the um, the, the other building next to it, uh, the corner, because 
uh, it's it's kind of narrow um, and kind of dangerous to to try to exit out of that street. Um, I um, anyway, thank thank you for um, taking my comments into consideration. Um, again, I'm I'm all for affordable housing. I I just think this is a little out of scale for uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next person on our list is Carol Kowalski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Carol Kowalski, 182 Situate Street. I am hoping the board will support this. I'm delighted uh, with this uh, project at this site, the way it's been designed, the way it's scaled. I am on Sunnyside and in this neighborhood a couple times a week. Uh, and I think the way we experience um, height on a narrow street is more intimate than the way we experience a plan view on a Zoom hearing. Uh, I think we'll, because of the um, very tasteful way that this has been designed, I think the experience one will have going down the street of this building will be very pleasant. I, I wanna also say how fortunate we are that we have HCA doing projects like this for our town making it real that Arlington welcomes all. I work for a nearby community where we're trying to advance housing opportunities and creating a housing trust. And uh, the community I work for is really behind Arlington and that's in large part because of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. They're tremendous partners they have proven themselves to be tremendous partners for the town. And I haven't heard anything this evening, and I hope the board agrees, haven't heard anything that's insurmountable. Uh, there, uh, there are some comments that have been touched on, and it sounds like the team is prepared to address them. So I don't believe, and I hope the board agrees, that there is no reason to scale back or to uh, to change anything substantively. Uh, it's it's very encouraging to me that um, we have HCA successfully securing this site because if this 40B were being done by a market rate developer, only 25%, as, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, at the beginning of the meeting, only 25% at most of these units would be affordable. HCA is making these affordable in, 100% of these units will be affordable and they will be affordable in perpetuity. And that's a huge win as we're really trying to continue to be a welcoming community. So I hope the board will will support this. And I, um, I, I appreciate that HCA has met with the uh, abutters and the neighbors. And just to finish up, I think it's fantastic that a residential use is being introduced here to tie in with the nearby wonderful residential neighborhood. So thank you, uh, and I hope you'll support it. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. Uh, the next speaker up is Monique Chaplin. Thank you for taking my comments. Uh, Monique Chaplin, 35 Michael Street, right around the corner from this proposed development. Um, I also firmly support uh, affordable housing in this uh, area. I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm, I also am concerned about the size of this building in this area, um, partly because uh, Sunnyside is a, very, is a narrow street as it exists now, and the traffic has been mentioned several times about concerns about the traffic, but really it's, it, can feel unsafe in the current in its current state in terms of sight line and visibility when trying to make turns and even just passing other cars on the street. Um, from a positive perspective, I love the idea of uh, having sidewalks and uh, that will be a, a terrific um, addition. Um, but uh, parking, I think, is going to remain a serious problem um, both. In relation to this project, the you know the the families that will be living in this project who may have more cars than parking spaces available, 
but also um, just the general parking issues in our in this area already um, are problematic for trying to um, access Broadway from Sunnyside. Um, I did want to um, express my appreciation uh, for uh, the designers taking into account our concerns about the garage safety. Um, having a door to the garage seems like an excellent uh, solution. I'm curious uh, how that will be managed. Is it like a key card system of um, pin numbers? Like, is that, um, has that been decided? Mr. Burns is. Oh, would you like me to, to answer that now? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't. We haven't decided specifically, but I can say from experience on past projects with similar conditions like this, um, there'll likely be, you know, a radio transponder like you would have for your residential garage. The residents that you know apply for parking stickers, like Erica was mentioning, would be given uh, a device like that, and we would also have a, a key fob system for the building as well. So there may be an opportunity to do both. I know there was also a comment um, from the board in their memo about some signaling devices for pedestrian safety and to alert drivers and pedestrians to make sure everyone was in communication about vehicles entering and exiting the garage. That's definitely something that's very easy to incorporate into the design and operation of the garage door. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. I had just a final comment. If it were possible to uh, make this uh, project work with even one fewer story that would be highly encouraged of, from my perspective because it's just a very very large building and I think putting it here sort of sets a precedent for other extremely large buildings being built right on this street where with um, Route 16 so close it's just uh, challenging to have that many people in this area. Um, thank you for taking my comments. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chaplin. Uh, the next speaker is Ken Garden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Ken Garden. I live at 8 Windsor Street in East Arlington. Um, I'm also a member of the HCA Real Estate Committee, and I I'm, I'm, um, would like to give my support to this uh, this building. Um, I think it's you know uh, really lucky to find such a large parcel in which you could you could um, you know put as many as 43 units. Um, you know, as we heard earlier, um, HCA I think um, has around 150 units right now, so this is a significant. Uh, increase in the number of units that they'll be able to offer to to you know to low income families, um, and the uh, the kinds of um, you know resources that Arlington is able to offer to you know to low income families are considerable. I mean, giving them access to high to you know to really well resourced schools here, not only you know the local grade school, but also you know the the Audison Middle School, the Arlington High School. I think is is uh, really great opportunities for you know for children in low income families. Um, the fact that it's across the street from a grocery store. To my mind, also within walking distance of the CVS on Mass Ave um, in East Arlington, um, you know, to to parks, you know, to to Waldo Park, for instance, um, to the the park and playground available also at the Thompson School. I, I think that you know that there are great uh, you know amenities available there. Um, it would be great, of course, if we could put buildings like this in you know neighborhoods um, that you know that are are considered to be more prime real estate in Arlington, but it's just impossible uh, to you know to compete with private developers when those kind of parcels become available. Um. And then also, of course, you know, this question of contamination is a serious one. Um, but, you know, I, I'd also point out that the high school itself, I mean, they 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 can't dig into the uh, the football field there because of contamination. Um, they wanted to put geothermal wells in, you know, to the current high school, you know, when they built the new building there, but weren't allowed to do that either because they aren't allowed to, you know, to dig into the, the ground there because of contamination. So it's not like, you know, it's only, um, you know, low-income housing that's being cited at places like this. I mean, also, you know, the, the place where my kids go to high school, um, you know, has those kinds of con concerns. So uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Garden. Um, we we have no new people on the list, but Mr. Moore uh, has raised his hand for a second time. Um, and Steve, Mr. Moore, the floor is uh, yours. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being recognized for a uh, second time. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, uh, in, in hindsight, uh, it's unfortunate that I went first. Um, in, in listening to all of these comments. This is my first exposure to 10 Sunnyside. And um, uh, I've been impressed by the comments that I've heard from the various folks that have given uh, some testimony here. Um, it sounds like this project has quite a lot going for it. And so I certainly appreciate uh, what folks have added. Um, 
my, my concern about contamination is just, you know, just one thing. And there's many, there's many things to weigh and consider with this project. And it sounds like um, there's lots and lots of uh, good points here as well. So I just wanted to take a take a moment to take a moment to have stated that as well. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay, we have nobody else on our, whoops. Well, we, I think we have nobody else on our list. Yes. Um, so we'll close the public comment period. And uh, I'd like to turn for a moment to uh, uh, Ms. O'Connor to see if the applicant has anything further that uh, that he would like to say in summing up. I don't think so, Mr. Hanlon, at this time. We're going to take the comments from the memorandum we received uh, from uh, the Director of Planning and uh, come back to you with some uh, recommendations at the next meeting. Great. Okay, so we now, the public comment period is closed. Uh, there are some uh, uh, business items that the board needs to uh, address. Um, and that is in a form of a, of a series of motions and, and things that, that we need to do in order to, uh, in order to continue on uh, to the series of hearings that, that uh, we'll be having in this case. Um, the first is, uh, and I'm hoping, and I would ask uh, Ms. O'Connor if she agrees with this, uh, that uh, this is today is the first day of the public hearing, uh, 180 day period, uh, if it starts as of today, which I, I think it ought to, um, would uh, expire in, uh, in late October, October 29th. Uh, and I'm wondering whether the applicant agrees with my understanding of the schedule. Yes, the applicant agrees. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd recognize, uh, excuse me, I'd invite a motion from the board to uh, uh, to establish that. Mr. Klein? Sure. Uh, I would move that having received the assent of the applicant, uh, the ZBA affirms that the 180-day hearing period for the purposes of 760 CMR 5605 sub 3 shall be deemed to have commenced on May 2nd, 2020. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Um, I take the rule on that. Uh, Mr. Klein. Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Um, golly. Uh, Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. Rico Deli. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that motion carries. Uh, the next motion involves uh, mm -hmm. uh, a detail on the records. Uh, we'd like to accept the application for, uh, from March 20th, 2023, including all documents, correspondence, and comments. Uh, and so the chair will invite a motion to that effect. The chairman. Mr. Klein. I move the ZBA receive all documents, correspondence, and comments submitted as a part of the initial application, including the table of waivers. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Mr. DuPont. We'll take the roll. Mr. Klein. Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion carries. Um, the next item would be in addition to incorporate minutes from the meetings of various town boards and commissions that have <clears> been <throat> conducted with representatives of the applicant up to the time of the application. Mr. Klein. <clears throat> I move that the ZBA incorporate all minutes from meetings of various town boards and commissions conducted with representatives of the applicant up to the time of the application. Second. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, take the roll, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Rickardelli. Aye. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. The chair votes aye. And did I forget somebody? Me. I vote Mr. aye. Mr. LeBlanc. LeBlanc. That's, I, I, I had the sense that I was coming up one short. Mr. LeBanc? Aye. Thank you. 
so the next is simply an announcement of something that we'll do next time. Um, the ZBA is going to eventually be requesting sums from the applicant under Chapter 44, Section 53G to prepare uh, transcripts of these proceedings and may also request further sums under Section 53G to uh, retain such peer review consultants as may appear necessary and appropriate for the review of the, of the proposed project. Uh, the board will determine in the light of this hearing and the comments received from the town, the applicant, and the public uh, what peer review consultants to retain in the scope of their service. Uh, the board intends to request the necessary funding under Section 53G at the next session of this hearing, uh, which is scheduled for May 16th, uh, 2023. Um, so that's simply an announcement of something that will come up in the future. We'll be working out the scope uh, of the uh, application and, and the necessary assistance that the board needs over the course of the next two weeks. The next item is to is to uh, request that council performs a completely review of the submitted application and provide a copy of the report uh, to the board and the applicant within 30 days of this hearing. Uh, and the chair invites a motion to that effect. Mr. Klein. I move that the ZBA request town council to perform a completeness review of the application and provide a report back to the board and the applicant within 30 days of this evening's hearing. Second. Or second, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, and we'll take the rule, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. <laughs> Aye. Not going to make that mistake again, although I could make an equivalent one. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And I was about to forget the chair votes aye. Um, the next item is one of the more important ones. Uh, it is uh, whether the board should assert safe harbor uh, in connection with this application. The board uh, is in receipt, although hasn't held very long, memorandum from the town updating the information that we had the last time there was a 40B. Uh, the update of the information indicated that there was no change, that the town uh, was not currently in a position to assert safe harbor and, or any of the statutory requirements that uh, the chair summarized at the beginning of this hearing. Uh, and therefore, the uh, chair would entertain a motion uh, regarding uh, the waiver assertion of the safe harbor. Mr. Klein. I move that upon review of the subsidized housing inventory, related town records, and the Department of Planning and Community Development memorandum regarding the status of the general land area minimum, the board confirms that the board will not assert safe harbor protection under 760 CMR. R56.03. Second. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. We'll take the roll again. Mr. Klein. Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Well, the chair votes aye, and he has the feeling he's come up one short. The, 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 who is it that I didn't call on? Mr. Holly. <laughs> oh, I thought I did. Uh, Mr. Holy, how do you how are you how do you vote on the matter? I thank you. All I. right. Um, the there the, there are two other motions. The one is that the board would like to have an on-site meeting to become better familiar with the site layout and connections to the community, and would invite a motion to that effect. Mr. Chair. Mr. Klein. I would move that the board request the applicant to propose possible dates and times for an on-site meeting to review site conditions with the board, the applicant, and their respective consultants. Second. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Um, I, I would almost love to say all in favor is please say aye. That would get me off the hook. Uh, but instead, I'm required to do a roll call. So, uh, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. aye. Mr. Holy. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Okay. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. And he thinks he's gotten everybody. Aye. All right. The final vote is. Uh, is the chair? Yes. Um, Mr. Klein here. Uh, before proceeding on to the, the 
final one. Um, I would like to have the opportunity just to, if we could just review with the board to make sure, see if there are any other outstanding questions the board has for the applicant to prepare for the next time. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. Uh, are there any other things that should be brought up for the board to help prepare for the next hearing? Things that you would want the applicant to be considering uh, as we go forward? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccardelli. I, I had jotted down a, a couple of items, um, and I think, you know, uh, not things that we have to answer now, but uh, just sort of questions to the applicant. Um, one, uh, I think that a lot of care has been, um, you know, uh, considered uh, with the, the front design along Sunnyside Ave uh, that we're, we're seeing on the screen right now. But uh, unfortunately or not, um, one of the main ways you see this site is actually kind of across the parking lot of, of the uh, Leahy building that's directly behind. Um, and because, you know, Sunnyside's so narrow, the, the viewport uh, that we're seeing in from Broadway is a lot actually more condensed than the one that you see from Broadway coming the other direction. So I wonder if the architect would, you know, provide some information on what the building looks like from that elevation, which seems to be much more of a, a sheer wall. I, I just wanna make sure that we're considering that as part of the design as well, not just this front elevation, which again, I think is, has been nicely considered. That, that Mr. Riccadelli, that's actually been raised by the planning department as well in the memo, and we will do that. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Riccadelli, do you have something else, I think? Yeah, just one more question. Um, uh, uh, I, I noticed on the plan that the um, the transformer is located kind of along the sidewalk along Sunnyside Ave. So I just wanted to ask um, the architect if um, you guys are planning to screen that and how it's going to be screened, or if uh, if there's you know a, a plan for that because it is sort of you know uh, once you create a nice streetscape there it is sort of uh, right at the end. So. Would you like me to okay. answer that now, Chair? No, I think that right now we're just basically accumulating points for future consideration. Sure. Mr. Is Chair. there anybody else from the, any other members of the board who have something that they wish uh, to put on the table? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Uh, DuPont. So it was just that I was listening to one of the uh, uh, public uh, comments, and I believe it was somebody who lived at Downing Square, if I'm not mistaken. And just a couple of things that she said uh, I thought were important to highlight. And I don't know to what extent the process actually addresses these, but I believe she was referring to the fact of interior air quality issues um, as a result of some activity on the site. So it wasn't necessarily at the time of construction. And then she commented, I believe that the build that the windows don't open. So I don't know sort of in the you know, course of what uh, people do in terms of engineering, whether those sort of after construction issues are addressed, but I did think it was something to acknowledge. And then of course, the issue about trash, uh, I think is really important as far as how that's handled. Because if she, um, if I remember her comment, she just said that there's, often trash on the sidewalk five days a week. And obviously we would want not to see that happen. So those are just uh, two points that sort of came to mind. Um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dubai. Yes, who, I'm sorry, I missed who, who spoke. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Uh I guess just to, to echo Mr. DuPont's um, comment about the trash, I, I picked up on that as well during that, the public comment. Um, you know, one thing you typically we might see in some of these is a is an interior trash chute. So I'm just also curious of how the, the trash is handled by residents uh, as well as maybe recycling. So that'll be something that I would look forward to hearing more about as we move forward in this process. Um, again, also related to that, is the uh, mail and uh, parcel uh, area. I noticed that both of them are located on the 
uh, what I would assume be the locked side of the vestibule. So I'm just curious how that would work, uh, especially with packages. That's a big thing that I see a lot. Um, and also hearing back from some other people um, that the people delivering packages necessarily don't take extra steps to um, properly deliver packages into maybe a spot that we have designated. Um, so it's something to, to think about there. They kind of just get left at the most convenient location. Um, and my last thing is with the uh, PV panels, if that's something that's being incorporated as part of this project or is being um, having the infrastructure added for later installation, um, if it's something that is getting installed as part of this initial construction, uh, we'd also like to see how that uh, looks on the building as well. Is it, you know, flat on the roof or is it raised on some type of um, angular uh, dunnage? Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. So one of the things we, we I'd, I'd also raised the question about what it looks like when you do the when you do the uh, wiring uh, or making making the uh, parking spaces wiring ready. It may very well be that it's a good idea to just to take a number of these concerns together in terms of of both uh, building envelope sorts of things and the uh, kinds of things that relate to things like uh, air quality. Uh, which are addressed by Passive House and the other kinds of concerns that uh, ultimately uh, relate to, uh, I mean, solar relates to uh, energy concerns and, and in general, the kind of conservation and uh, net zero or getting towards net zero considerations that uh, were somewhat described earlier, but that we might want to go into as an ensemble and a little more deeply. Okay, is there anything else? Mr. Chair. Mr. Holy. Yeah, this, just to echo on two people who have mentioned from the public about the building hike issue. Um, there is a, I shouldn't say substantial, but there's a, enough grade variation happening. We would like to get um, the height of the building on the average grade, which I don't think it's there currently shown, but from various sides and also the height of the low roof versus the, you know, the high roof parapet versus the low roof and so on would help get an idea and look at it from the building height perspective. Okay. Mr. Klein. Thank you. Um, I, the, the, the last piece I would just ask is if, um, if the applicant would consider uh, putting together a, a shadow study just to uh, better understand the the impacts of the size of the building on the surrounding buildings. Mr. Connor, we we can look at that. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that I think was lightly mentioned earlier that that certainly needs to be addressed, uh, and that we will be talking about later on, has to do with the. Uh, with the possibility that Mr. Klein raised uh, about some sort of a crosswalk mid block uh, that would enable to have a, that would facilitate a safe movement of pedestrians from one bus stop to the next. And uh, uh, that also, I think, particularly with, with the, the decided stress that uh, transit has in the transportation picture of, of this, uh, given the parking, uh, the relatively small amount of parking, uh, it, it would be particularly useful to make sure that the interface with the uh, transit system operates smoothly and, uh, and safely. Uh, and the other thing uh, is that it was mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, by Mr. Klein, uh, the Safe Streets uh, Alliance for the Broadway area. Um, and that uh, is headed up by Vince Boudouin, uh, <clears throat> who's a town meeting member from uh, Precinct One. And uh, it would probably be desirable to consult with them. They uh, they are deeply involved in this and in this the general issue of safe streets in, uh, in East Arlington and in this area. And uh, I'm sure would have a lot of interesting things to say in a conversation. Do we have anyone else? Any, any other members of the board? Okay, I I, I do want to comment that I I have not 
uh, been recognizing uh, at this point after I close the public hearing, uh, additional speakers from the public. Uh, we, we, we just don't do that after it is closed, um, but there will be others and I welcome everybody to come back, uh, hopefully to say different things next time, but uh, we're going to be working through various issues that have been raised by the town, by the citizens and by us. And, uh, and we uh, will welcome your input uh, at every stage along the way until we get to our final deliberations. So is there is there anything else before I entertain a motion to, to continue the hearing? Um, can I, if I could just ask, will we be, um, for those of us who live in the neighborhood, do we, will we get notified as to when the, the next meeting is? You'll get okay. notified of it in, almost immediately when we say, when we continue to a certain date, which is May 16th. Oh, May, oh, May 16th. Okay. But no, there's not going to be new notifications, uh, except in so far as you can follow. Uh, th these things are all, you know, scheduled by on the town website and through the town system of notices. Okay, thank you. Right. So the uh, the next the next motion, the final one uh, that in this long series uh, is the adjourning the tonight's hearing until Tuesday, May sixteenth, twenty twenty three and that a schedule for future hearings be developed uh, uh, at that time uh, for a presentation at this hearing. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? Mr. Klein. I would move that tonight's hearing be continued until Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Seconded by Mr. Uh, DuPont. Uh, Ms. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye and hope he's gotten everybody. But if he hasn't, he's got a majority anyhow. Thank, thank you all very much. Good night. Hey, thank you. Good night. Uh, before you jump off, we have to do it. We have to move to adjourn. That that didn't that didn't just happen. So the chair will entertain the motion to adjourn. Well, first of all, is, is there any comment or any anything anyone wishes to raise before we adjourn? Um, I would just um, mention to the board on, on the uh, this uh, comprehensive permit application for uh, ten twenty one ten twenty seven Massachusetts Avenue. Um, that after consultation with the board. Uh, so at our previous hearing on um, April 25th, the board voted to close the public hearing on that application. Uh, the board is moving on to the phase now where we discuss and deliberate uh, the final um, uh, decision on that. Uh, and the board has 40 days uh, from that, that date uh, to complete it. Uh, the first session for uh, that deliberation will be uh, Thursday, May 11th uh, at 7.30 over Zoom. Um, these are these meetings of the board are not hearings. They are public meetings. Um, and the board is not able to take additional comment as the public comment period has been closed. So uh, the, there will be, the public is invited to watch and attend, but uh, the public may not uh, actively participate in those meetings. Thank you, Mr. Klein. All right. Well, thank you very much for participating in the meeting. It has been uh, productive and uh, and a welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Lau, who is here, and Ms. Ralston, who has done ably uh, manage this, manage the uh, the technical aspect of all of this. Uh, the only person who's completely flubbed up on the technical aspect of all of this is yours truly. Uh, and so someday they're going to have to figure out a way of keeping the list of participants from changing every time you vote. Um, it's it, it becomes very hard to follow who you've already de dealt with. But, but we'll get this better as we have we'll get more experience with it. Um, so... Uh, the uh, chair will entertain a motion to... Adjourn. So moved. Just moved by Mr. Klein. Is there a second? Second. 
seconded by Mr. Riccardelli. Uh, we'll run the bowl, roll because we have to. Uh, Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont? I think the reason he didn't second may very well be he left. I think so. <laughs> All right. The chair didn't leave. Not yet, anyway. And he's going to vote. Mr. Holly is still here as well. I think I did, got, got Mr. Holly, didn't I? Mr. Holly, no, are you there? Not this. I I am here. Yeah. Hi. Okay. All right. So it's unanimous. Uh, thanks for your indulgence. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next Thursday. Next Tuesday, actually, I guess. No, next Thursday. I know. All right, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody.